department, the chair of the English department. And uh, Gail actually has a wonderful book on the concept of speculation from the early modern period to the modern time. Both speculation in science, how it ties with actually finance. And uh, it's actually a wonderful research project on the history of ideas and the history of science. Uh, so I, I would like to highlight that talk. I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. So uh, you're all invited to join us on uh, on Friday and on Tuesday. If you want to join online rather than in person, go to the website, uh, check the calendar, and you can register there. Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Eric uh, Fisher, who uh, is um, a center fellow at uh, this semester uh, here. Uh, again, he's a, um, a professor, I think, reader is a technical term, uh, in philosophy at the University of East Anglia. He has published extremely widely on a range of, of topics uh, in the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of, of language, and he's one of the leading experimental philosophers. I really like his, uh, his work. I think he's pioneered a new way of doing uh, experimental philosophy using psycholinguistic method. And we might hear a bit about that uh, today. He's written a range of uh, articles. I don't have time to go, but I just flag out a few recent articles, some of which I really, really love. Uh, um, he has a paper on zombie intuition with uh, Justin Sisma uh, from, from formerly from our department, uh, which is a wonderful paper in cognition recently published. He has a, an amazing paper in what it is like to be uh, colorblind, which uh, an experimental study, which uh, you know, going beyond anecdotes to try to understand what the phenomenon of colorblindness. He has published something that probably will be related on the role of stereotypes uh, uh, in, in thought in the philosophy of mind. Uh, he's the editor of Methodological Advances in Experimental Philosophy. And he wrote a few years ago a book on linguistic creativity, which was now almost, almost 10 years ago. He also pioneered uh, adversarial collaboration in uh, philosophy, people who disagree about the topic coming together to try to resolve their, their disagreement, which I think is a wonderful way of uh, doing philosophy, which is very unusual, I think, turned out to be extremely successful. And as he explained to us, he was right, but his opponent also thought that he was right too. <laughs> That's what philosophers do. He, he had actually pinpointed a relevant factor, so everybody was happy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, today, again, we'll be talking about experimental argument, analysis, reasoning, and stereotypes. Thanks. Right, uh, thank you so much for this generous introduction, Edouard. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, turning up in person. It is such a lovely, if still disconcerting experience to be talking to people in flesh and blood rather than just faces on the screen. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm afraid in, in, in return, I'm just going to uh, confirm your worst fears about being a one track horse because I'm basically going to talk about the research program that Edouard has already flagged up. The research program of experimental argument analysis. Now, Experimental argument analysis examines the roots of verbal reasoning and automatic language processing. Now, whenever you hear, read, utter, write a word, the word triggers automatic inferences that you cannot help making, regardless of the context. And expert, this research program, Experimental Argument Analysis, EAA for short, examines how these kinds of default inferences shape verbal reasoning, for better or worse. Indeed, um, in a slightly unsunny spirit, it very much focuses on the effects for the worse, because it tries to use findings in order to explain and expose fallacies in verbal reasoning, starting with fallacies in philosophical argument. So the key idea is to expose and explain previously unnoticed fallacies in verbal reasoning by gaining insight into how biases systematically affect automatic language processing and how they systematically affect the kind of automatic inferences that ultimately drive 
verbal reasoning. So I have developed this research program and interdisciplinary collaborations with a couple of wonderful colleagues, uh, including here psycholinguist Paul Engelhardt, uh, pictured here receiving a prize, uh, computational linguist Aurélie Albelot, um, pictured here with a pipe that will be a recurring theme in this talk, and a fellow experimental philosopher, Justin Sitzman, who, um, as Edouard already pointed out a long time ago, received his PhD from this very august institution, uh, supervised indeed by the then young, dynamic, and very much up and coming experimental philosopher, Edouard Marchery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're still dynamic, but you're now well established. <laughs> okay, so in this talk, I'll first try to persuade those of you who have not yet lost any sleepless nights to comprehension inferences and comprehension biases of the uh, quite a philosophical interest of this topic. So I'll use a rather broad brush in order to um, bring out the key philosophical, one key mo philosophical motivation and rationale of EAA. And then I'd like to walk you through a worked example that illustrates the three key steps involved in experimental argument analysis. First, the reconstruction of an argument that identifies a potential fallacy in it, the psycholinguistic explanation of this fallacy, which supports the previous reconstruction, and then the experiments made in order to support this psycholinguistic explanations, experiments which mainly use eye tracking um, methods that I'm trying to promote here a bit at what is after all the center of experimental philosophy. So, um, I'll now say something about how a grand ambition can be pursued in a rather down-to-earth manner. Well, the down-to-earth manner is meant to be provided by experimental argument analysis, and the grand ambition is provided by Immanuel Kant. Kant famously articulated the ambition to place metaphysics on the secure path of a science with methods that go beyond mere groping among concepts. Now, I'm not going to engage in any kind of Kant exegesis here. I'll just use this to lead up to the greater question um, of how we can practice at any rate parts of philosophy as a science, i.e. with scientific methods, without lapsing into scientism, i.e. without unduly assimilating distinctively and characteristically philosophical problems to scientific problems that have a different structure. These days, it's natural to turn for a first answer to experimental philosophy. After all, experimental philosophy uses methods from the cognitive sciences and social sciences in order to address philosophical uh, questions and problems. However, not just any old experimental philosophy is going to be relevant for this. Experimental philosophers tend to conduct studies with two very different directions of thrust. Many studies, are in line with a sort of traditional methodological naturalism that encourages people to, and encourages philosophers, regardless of whether they're experimental or other, to base their theories on the best available scientific evidence and theory uh, and uh, findings. Well, in line with this, quite a number of experimental philosophers are complementing extant work in cognitive science by conducting their own studies on cognitive phenomena of philosophical interest. When proceeding in this way, X5 often is cognitive science and does not really help us to answer the question of how distinctively and specifically philosophical problems can be addressed in a scientific manner. So 
for that, I'd like to draw attention to that body of work in X5 that does something rather new and different. That body of work that addresses philosophical questions about a certain phenomenon of interest through empirical investigation, not of that phenomenon, but of how people think and speak about that phenomenon. This is a distinctively new kind of methodological naturalism. Um, I try to advocate a label metaphilosophical naturalism for it. And it's, uh, of course, most prominently exemplified by evidential experimental philosophy, that strand of, exp of experimental philosophy that um, tries to assess the evidentiary value of intuitions that are deduced as evidence for philosophical theory, and that does so through empirical studies on their sensitivity to epistemically Osho's parameters, their robustness, and indeed their etiology. However, intuition-driven philosophizing is not the only philosophical card onto which X5 can put empirical wheels through examining how people think and talk about phenomena of interest. And indeed, of course, uh, a number of people working in XFI, uh, evidential XFI, uh, would not try to put wheels on this particular card, but would rather like to trash it, um, or indeed to, uh, well, cut it down to size a bit, which is where, unfortunately, my uh, card analogy begins to flounder terribly. So, okay, let's have a look at another philosophical card onto which you can put empirical wheels by having a look at how people, how people experimentally having a look at how people think and talk about topics. This other philosophical card is ordinary language philosophy. As developed in the mid 20th century by figures including J.L. Austin, who you see here with this notorious pipe. Experiment, uh, ordinary language philosophy was analytic philosophy's first attempt to overcome limitations of armchair reflection through informal experiments, peer group uh, based focus groups and empirical surveys. So in many ways, ordinary language philosophy is one of the most direct historical precursors to today's X5. The ordinary language philosophers mooted two big ideas that jointly give empirical investigations into how people think and talk about the topic, a really central role to play in addressing distinctively philosophical problems. The first big idea was shared by actually quite a number of ordinary language philosophers who maintained that at any rate, several important philosophical problems arise in a quite distinctive way. Namely, they arise only due to a certain kind of motivating reasoning that crucially involves conceptual confusions and verbal fallacies. Now, this unkind view is most plausible for problems that arise from antinomies where philosophical arguments seem to lead to a conclusion that directly challenges what common sense regards as a familiar fact. And which have us wonder how this apparent fact is as much as possible. Arguably, Plato was thinking of these kinds of antinomies, these kinds of problems that seem to call into question the very possibility of familiar facts, when he spoke of a sense of wonder, puzzlement as being the starting point of all philosophizing. Problems um, that are still conceived today in ways that are roughly amenable to this kind of conception would include skeptical problems, problem of mental causation, problem of free will, or the problem of perception. 
that we'll have a look at in more detail in a moment. So this would seem to be one class of distinctively philosophical problems that we might want to tackle in a scientific manner in order to address Kant's challenge. So let's have a look at one particular example, a problem that a bunch of marketing geniuses managed to establish the name the problem of perception for. So um, philosophers of perception out there realize if you're working on a different problem, probably you're working on something irrelevant because this is the problem of perception. Um, yeah, and even the Stanford Encyclopedia now calls it that way. So the problem of perception um, arises through arguments known as arguments from illusion and hallucination that Lead, that proceed from the rather modest assumption that there are such things as illusions and hallucinations, these phenomena occur, or in more cautious versions, even just that it just assumes that these kinds of things are possible. And then lead from there to the conclusion that whenever we use our five senses, we are aware, or at any rate, directly aware only of subjective immaterial percepts, sense data, what have you, rather than physical objects. And this is taken to directly challenge the direct realism that is thought to be implicit in common sense conceptions of our five senses, say common sense conceptions of vision. These arguments thereby motivate the question, so how is sense perception, as we commonly understand it, even possible, given that there are illusions and hallucinations. So that's the standard formulation of the problem of perception today. The tempting thought now is that, well, proceeds from the, the observation that only these arguments suggest that there is some sort of conflict between our common sense conception of say vision on the one hand and on the other hand the occurrence of illusions and hallucinations so hang on if these arguments crucially involve fallacies in particular if they involve fallacious inferences already in their very first steps so that I don't get off the ground, then it stands to reason that the so well-marketed problem does not arise in the first place. In line with this kind of thinking, J.L. Austin devoted a monograph or rather a lecture series, Sense and Sensibilia, um, to a quite influential attempt to dissolve the problem by exposing mainly verbal fallacies in the underlying arguments. Now, the second big idea of OLP was mooted quite specifically by Austin himself. To put it in modern terms, his suggestion is that many philosophical arguments rely on contextually inappropriate stereotypical inferences. Let's unpack that a bit. As standardly conceived in cognitive psychology, stereotypes are implicit knowledge structures in semantic memory that encode information about statistical regularities that are observed in physical or discourse environment. So whenever you city kid, see a tomato, presumably in the supermarket or your own kitchen, well, it tends to be red, right? So knowledge structure builds up that associates tomatoes with being red. These kind of knowledge structures uh, can be associated with nouns and verbs and are then known as also as prototypes or situation schemas, respectively. As traditionally conceived, they represent sets of weighted features that come to mind first when we hear those wor words and that are typical diagnostic or predictive of the relevant category. Priming experiments tell us that 
these features get activated really rapidly by the verbal stimulus, indeed, typically in less than 250 milliseconds. Once activated, a stereotype suppo supports automatic stereotypical inferences to attributions of the uh, stereotypical feature. So I say tomato, you think red. As you infer that the thing I'm talking about is going to be red. But you note, of course, these inferences are probabilistic and perfectly defeasible. Probably that tomato is going to be red. And I don't contradict myself at all if I say that, oh, the tomatoes I bought yesterday were still green. All fine. Now, the crucial suggestion that Austin is making is that philosophical arguments include these kinds of defeasible inferences, namely in contexts that defeat them. Now, the perfectly sensible response to the suggestion is, really? Now, why is that? After all, one of the major upshots of psycholinguistic research into sentence comprehension over the last decades has been that language users are really good at contextualizing default information. Um, I'll skip a lot of detail here. I would just ask you to remember one fun fact here, namely inferences that clash with contextual information or background knowledge are, can be suppressed within less than one second. And in this case, they do not go on to influence further judgment and reasoning. All right, so just because one of these inferences is triggered doesn't mean that it actually influences your argument. Hmm. Now, attributing fallacies to philosophers is tricky business at the best of times. The interpretation of philosophical texts is rightly governed by principles of charity that ask us to credit authors with certain levels of rationality, logical acumen, linguistic competence. This creates a tension with the attribution of fallacies. Medium strength principles of charity seek to resolve this tension by allowing us to attribute fallacies to authors only if the attribution is supported by an empirically supported explanation that explains us when and why even competent thinkers make this particular kind of fallacy. So in order to make good Austin's at first sight, rather <clears throat> bold suggestion, we need to develop a psycholinguistic explanation that explains when and why people should fail to contextualize the default inferences. What's more, we're talking about default inferences, which are made automatically. So people are not enjoying some kind of privileged first person access to them, They're typically unconscious, whatever some pragmatists are going to tell you about easy recoverability. Actually to establish that these things occur requires experiments. So in order to make good this promise extended by the critical strand of ordinary language philosophy, we need to provide it with empirical foundations, with methods that allow us to experimentally document the positive inferences and explanations that let us understand when and why people make bad inferences. These kinds of empirical foundations are exactly what is provided by experimental argument analysis. EAA, you recall, studies how default inferences drive verbal reasoning, 
the focus of our work has been on how stereotypical inferences shape philosophical arguments, and in particular, on how stereotypical inferences may go wrong in philosophical argument. To do so, we combine experimental methods from psycholinguistics and analytic and hermeneutic methods from uh, philosophy in order to diagnose fallacies in philosophical arguments, then develop and test psycholinguistic explanations of these fallacies, and finally, experimentally document the fallacies that have been posited in the arguments. Okay, while the underlying ambition has remained unstated in the papers developing this program, um, I'm coming clean about it now. So the grand ambition that actually keeps moves this forward is the Kantian ambition to develop one way of doing philosophy in which at least one class of distinctively and characteristically philosophical problems can be addressed with impeccably scientific methods that make an essential rather than just nice add-on contribution to solving the problem. Okay, so after this cackle, let's get to the meat. One worked example. We'll have a look at one of the two arguments that generate jointly the problem of perception, namely the argument from hallucination. And I'll now walk you through the three steps involved. I'll first walk you through a reconstruction of the argument that identifies a fallacy of equivocation in the argument. I'll then walk you through an explanation of when and why even competent thinkers commit this kind of fallacy. You remember, our key idea is to explain fallacies by a reference to comprehension biases, to biases that systematically affect automatic language processing. And the explanation I'll present invokes the linguistic salience bias that has been discovered and documented by us. In the third step, I'll then present some of the experiments that we've done in order to uh, support this explanation and the reconstruction, which will employ the psycholinguistic cancellation paradigm. And that's, that's something I hope some of you are also going to use in future. Okay, so reconstruction. Now, let's have a look at a classic statement of the argument. That's due to A.J. Ayer, one of the most influential British philosophers in the mid 20th century. What makes this statement of the argument so compelling is that Ayer here really very, very carefully teases apart different senses or uses of perception verbs that are being used in the argument. And before he goes on to develop the argument, clearly distinguishes perceptual uses of verbs like see, hear, whatever, and phenomenal uses that are meant to be used to just to describe the viewer's subjective experience. So no epistemic or other factive implications. No, we're just talking about what it's like for the chap to see something. Right? Okay, so here's the argument. Let us take as an example Macbeth's visionary dagger. There is an obvious perceptual sense in which Macbeth did not see the dagger. He did not see the dagger for the sufficient reason that there was no dagger there for him to see. There is another phenomenal sense, however, in which it may quite properly be said that he did see a dagger. To say that he saw a dagger is quite a natural way of describing his experience. But still not a real dagger, not a physical object. If we are to say that he saw anything, it must have been something that was accessible to him alone. A sense taker. This is the first half of the argument that is trying to persuade you that in this quite special case of visual hallucination, a viewer is just aware of a sense datum 
the second half of the argument, of which there are several different versions, then tries to generalize from this one special case to all cases of visual perception. But we're not going to uh, look at that. Typically, the argument is meant to be a deductive argument. So I will now present to you a reconstruction that seeks to put together a deductive argument from the bits that are highlighted here in bold. Okay, so it assumes that there was no real dagger there and that even so Macbeth did see a dagger. Now, to move on to the next uh, claim that Macbeth did not see a real dagger, we need to interpolate the assumption that if Macbeth saw a real dagger, there was a real dagger there. And follows with modest tolerance that indeed Macbeth did not see a real dagger. The argument implicitly assumes that Macbeth did not see any other object either. Therefore, Macbeth did not see a physical object. Hence, if Macbeth saw any object, he saw a non-physical object. Let's just call that a sense datum. Ah, but before we assumed that Macbeth did see a dagger, an object. So, hey, it follows from seven and two that Macbeth did see a sense data. Now, as reconstructed here, the argument relies on a fallacy of equivocation that is meant to be brought out by the color coding of the verb. In three, if Macbeth saw a real dagger, there was a real dagger there, the verb is clearly used in a standard perceptual sense with factored implications. You can only see something in this sense if that thing is actually around to be seen. So three and all the steps that are being derived from it need to use the verb in this dominant visual sense highlighted here in red. But oh, so this, this crucially includes then seven, but oh, in the final step, the conclusion is being inferred from seven and two. The one assumption in the argument in which the verb is being explicitly used in the phenomenal sense. So looks like a fallacy of equivocation. To unpack that a bit, Recall that the phenomenal sense is meant to be used to just describe a viewer's subjective experience. So on one explication of this uh, use, S sees an F in a phenomenal sense means that S has an experience like that of seeing an F. Oh, now, Aya, uh, sorry, <laughs> Macbeth is meant to have an experience just like that of seeing a physical dagger. Therefore, in the phenomenal sense, it's perfectly fit and proper to say that Macbeth is seeing a physical dagger. By contrast, it's not okay to say in the phenomenal sense that Macbeth sees some sort of translucent non-physical dagger. Sorry, no, that's just not what his experience is meant to be like. Therefore, the move from Macbeth saw a dagger to but still not a real dagger, is fallacious. Now, this reconstruction may fit the text quite nicely, but we are running head on into the challenge from the principle of charity that I mentioned a moment ago. After all, Aya explains the two relevant senses of perception verbs before he states the argument. He then explicitly marks their use in the argument, in one sense, in the other, right? So our reconstruction suggests that Aya made a factive inference from the phenomenal use that's only licensed by the perceptual sense. This implies that a competent speaker, AJ Aya, violated a semantic rule he explained a few lines up, his very own explanation of the phenomenal use, and does so in an inference from a premise where the special use of the word was explicitly marked. I mean, excuse me, this is about as 
much in conflict with the principle of charity, as you can imagine. So we definitely need a bit of empirical backup here. We definitely need an empirical explanation of when and why even perfectly competent thinkers commit this kind of fallacy of equivocation. So I'll now build up to an explanation of the sort, which will illustrate, again, the key idea of experimental argument analysis, namely the idea that we can explain and expose fallacies in verbal reasoning by gaining insight into biases that systematically affect automatic language processing, that systematically affect comprehension processes. So to account for um, fallacies of equivocation of this sort, we proposed that um, there is a bias in the processing of words with several distinct but related senses, so-called polysemous words, which by the way, might be of interest because at least 40% of words of English uh, in English are polysemous and uh, philosophers are in the habit, of course, of giving um, special uh, senses or uses to familiar words, thereby um, definitely taking advantage of or even increasing polysemy. So the idea is that polysemy processing is beset by a comprehension bias as a result of which inferences that are supported only by the dominant sense are made from subordinate uses and go on to influence further cognition. So in our case, the idea is that an inference that it's supported only by the dominant visual use of C is being made also from a subordinate phenomenal use. When Talking the other week uh, to the psychology department, I spent over half an hour developing this bias, the linguistic salience bias, but perhaps here I'll be a lot more brief. Um, so you get the executive summary. There's considerable psycholinguistic evidence to suggest that polysemes activate a unitary representation of semantic information. So it's not that we have for each of the different senses of a polysemous word, a distinct semantic representation, rather these words activate a unitary representation that consists in overlapping clusters of semantic features, crucially including overlapping clusters of stereotypical features, overlapping stereotypes. So that interpretation of any specific use of the polysemous word, where it's used in one sense rather than any of the others, requires identifying and extracting from this larger unitary representation just the features that are relevant for this sense, for the relevant sense, and disregarding all the other information that's packed into um, the unitary representation because it's relevant for some other senses that don't matter in, in your context. In other words, interpreting a subordinate use, like say uh, the phenomenal use of a C or the purely epistemic use of C as illustrated by Jack Saw Jane's point, interpreting such a subordinate use requires activating all contextually relevant features, but crucially also suppressing all contextually irrelevant features that are activated anyway by the stimulus because they're packed into that same big unitary representation. So in other words, they need to be applied with, uh, they need to be interpreted with uh, what Rachel Biora has called the retention suppression strategy. Quick example, dominant sense of C is associated with a situation schema that includes various typical agent properties and various typical properties of patients acted on, well, in this case, viewed, seen. So agent properties 
uh, would include S has eyes, S looks at X, S knows X is there, S knows X is. Well, patients are typically medium-sized dry goods, and they stand in certain relations to the agent. Namely, they're in front of the agent and kind of near the agent. Now, in order to interpret Jack saw Jane's point, we need precisely two of these features. S knows X is there, and S knows what X is, right? So Jack knows there is a point of Jane's, and he knows what that point is. Everything else is irrelevant and needs to be suppressed. So that's what the um, strike in the table on the right there is meant to illustrate. So, okay, we, we, we need to suppress quite a lot here, right? But we're now going to build up to difficulty about that. Two factors may conspire to make it excessively difficult to suppress all these other features. First has to do with um, principles of feature activation. Now, features that are shared, semantic features that are shared by all uh, senses of a policy are activated most strongly and most rapidly. For all the other features, activation, strength of activation is a function of basically exposure frequency modulated by prototypicality. So exposure frequency, this means that the more often you encounter a word in one sense rather than another, so relative exposure really, the more strongly the features associated with that sense are activated when you encounter it. Prototypicality means that features that are deemed to make for particularly good example of the category, say particularly good examples of seeing events, are activated more strongly. So these two measures are packed together in the notion of linguistic salience, uh, which uh, please note, it's got nothing to do with the sort of salience you find um, in uh, other word, uh, works on salience effects. It's not a contextual magnitude. Rather, it is a function of exposure frequency over time modulated by prototypicality. Okay, so if you've now got a very strong salience imbalance, if one sense of both policy is way more frequent than all others, then the relevant features will be, will be activated particularly strongly. Ah, second important principle of activation, frequently co-instantiated component features of a situation schema exchange lateral co-activation. So they don't just get activated by the stimulus. No, they exchange activation among each other. That means that when only some, but not all of them are relevant for interpreting uh, subordinate use, ouch, we're gonna run into problems. We're gonna run into problems because also the irrelevant features receive strong activation initially and continue to be activated by their usual mates. This reasoning leads us to the linguistic salience bias hypotheses. Slightly simplified statement here. When one sense of a polysemous word is much more salient than all others, and when interpretation of utterances with a subordinate sense requires selective suppression, some but not all, of features associated with the dominant sense, then contextually inappropriate stereotypical inferences that are supported only by the dominant sense will be made also from the subordinate use and go on to influence judgment and reasoning. So in other words, when these two conditions are met, when we've got massive salience imbalances and selective suppression is required for interpretation, then even competent thinkers will be swept along 
by the feasible stereotypical inferences that are cancelled, that are defeated by the disambiguating context. We garnered empirical support for this hypothesis through about 10 studies to date, which crucially include um, one cross-linguistic replication for typologically radically different languages, um, namely German and Japanese, but final. And crucially, one study with professional philosophers, which showed that professional philosophers are no less susceptible to this bias than psychology undergraduates. And that finding really warrants um, deploying linguistics aliens bias in order to explain fallacies in philosophical arguments. So these studies, uh, almost all of these studies used the cancellation paradigm that psycholinguists have developed in order to study automatic comprehension inferences. In this paradigm, participants are asked to read sentences where the word of interest is followed by context that is inconsistent with the hypothesized inference from the word of interest. So, for example, if you're interested in a really boring hypothesis that, oh, SC's X triggers um, spatial inferences to X's in front of S, you could ask people to read sentences like Cheryl sees the picture on the wall behind her. If the inference from sees is made, namely to, well, the thing seen is in front of Cheryl, then there will be a clash between this conclusion and the final bit behind her. And this clash causes comprehension difficulties, which require cognitive effort to overcome. This kind of cognitive effort is being indexed by different measures that we can pick up in eye tracking. For a start, our pupils dilate. Second, we take longer to read and reread the cancellation phrase, this behind her. And we make more backwards eye movements, as in, Hey, wait a minute, I thought she saw the picture. Our studies include three eye tracking studies on spatial inferences from see and aware of that together amount to perhaps the most elegant demonstration of linguistic silence bias, which is why I'll walk you through one of them now. Um, Up front. Um, sorry, this is now going into a bit of detail for just two minutes. Let me let me explain why we are looking at C and aware of. Well, corpus and production studies showed us that these two verbs have got salience imbalances in exactly the opposite direction. So for C, the clearly dominant sense is the visual sense way over 60% of users. Uh, epistemic users, 12.5%. Phenomenal users, 1.2 in BNC, British National Corpus. By contrast, for aware of, things are flipped around. There, the epistemic users account for 80% of um, occurrences in the BNC, and only in 20% of cases um, is the verb used to talk about cases of visual awareness where you grow aware of something because, well, you see it. However, interestingly, production studies show that cases of visual awareness are highly prototypical of aware of. That means that people are going to make inferences, stereotypical inferences, um, supported by the seeing schema, also from aware of, but because of the flipped salient structure, they're gonna have no trouble suppressing them. Okay, so that's why this is a good pair. In both cases, stereotypic spatial inferences are triggered first, but in the case of C, ooh, they should be really tough to suppress, whereas in the case of aware, hey, piece of cake. <laughs> 
Okay, so in this study, um, we were basically asking two questions. First, we wanted to uh, know about word processing, uh, namely, is the retention suppression strategy really used for to interpret epistemic uses of C? And second, in this case, uh, the linguistic uh, salience bias hypothesis would apply. And second, well, this hypothesis then predicts that some inappropriate spatial inferences will be made even from um, epistemic uses. So are they made? Now, we used, in order to be able to examine both kinds of questions, questions not just about automatic inference, but also about word processing, we used fixation times as a measure. Contrary to common misperceptions, um, reading really is not a smooth process at all. Rather, your eyes, when you read, move and stops and starts. You skip words that are highly predictable in context and go back at points of difficulty. That means that difficulties at different stages of text uh, comprehension can manifest in different reading time measures. So difficulties in word recognition, for example, depend basically just on word frequency, length, and predictability in context, and these jointly determine first pass reading time. By contrast, difficulties in, read, in integrating local interpretations of a few adjacent words into more comprehensive interpretations of the entire sentence, they require, uh, they show up in late measures, in total reading times and in rereading times, some rereading times, which are often also known as second pass reading times. They also show up in number of regressions, right, when your eyes dot back to previous text. So, hypothesized inferences from the verb, as in our case, should lead to longer integration difficulties and longer reading times, total reading times, for either the conflict reason, regions where things clash, where the conclusion clashes with the sequel, as in behind her, come on, I infer it in front of her, or else in the source region where the source of the problem, as it were, um, that triggered the problematic inference. Our study used um, stimuli where either see or aware of was followed by either abstract or concrete objects. The idea being that concrete objects like the picture will invite visual interpretations, whereas abstract objects like the problems will invite metaphorical, purely epistemic interpretations. And then finally, contexts that are either consistent or inconsistent with spatial, inter with spatial inferences from the prior verb, as consistent or as inconsistent, they place the object either literally or metaphorically ahead or behind of the viewer. Okay, I think I'll skip the processing bit and we'll just focus on the prediction for automatic inferences. So if we make spatial inferences, even, even after the verb has been disambiguated by the object, and it's now clear that it's being used in a purely epistemic sense. If even so, there are, if even so, there are spatial inferences, these will clash with the information given by uh, behind him, but not ahead of him. And as a result, people will take longer to read and in particular to reread the end, the final words in Joe sees the problems that lie behind him, as opposed to John sees the problems that lie ahead of him. Crucially, recall 
automatic inferences in and of themselves are not terribly interesting. These things may get stamped on the head and are then of no more interest if they get completely suppressed. The thousand dollar question is, do these things get suppressed or do they influence further reasoning? Do they influence further judgment? We therefore combined the reading task with a plausibility rating task, which has an actually pretty elegant prediction. Now, consider again our epistemic items, stuff like Joe sees the problems ahead of him or Joe sees the problems that lie behind him. Now, the epistemic sense of see, which dictionaries explain as know or understand, and the totally familiar space-time metaphors that place, well, for, according to which ahead means in the future and behind means in the past. They facilitate a purely metaphorical interpretation of these items, which are tantamount to Joe knows what problems he will have in the future and Joe knows what problems he had in the past. In a norming study, we elicited plausibility ratings for such explicit knowledge claims and found that people were regarding past directed sentences like Joe knows what problems he had in the past as more plausible than future directed sentences like Joe knows what problems he will have in the future. But that's of course entirely unsurprising. The future is damned hard to know about, so of course people found that less plausible. Ha! Huh. But now, complete suppression of spatial inferences predicts that people will win through to this purely metaphorical interpretation and therefore will find items like Joe sees the problems that lie behind him more plausible than items like Joe sees the problems ahead of him. By contrast, our hypothesis predicts complete suppression is impossible. They're not gonna manage that. We know that space-time metaphors are associated with embodied cognition effects and support spatial reasoning about temporal relations. So a persistent spatial inference from the verb is going to prevent metaphorical interpretation. It's going to engage re spatial reasoning and it's going to create the impression of a conflict in items like John sees the problems that lie behind him. So this predicts the exact opposite pattern and plausibility ratings, because people are just not going to find it plausible at all that he should see things behind him. That's the first prediction. The second prediction is a comparison, see aware. You remember, aware of, has got a dominant sense that's purely epistemic, therefore total suppression, not a problem. So, okay, inferences, spatial inferences will be initially made, but they'll be hit on the head, they will be completely suppressed, people will win through to a metaphorical interpretation. And on this metaphorical interpretation, as we've seen from our pre-study, um, these um, backwards facing sentences, as it were, are more plausible, right? Therefore, they will think that um, aware items are more plausible than see items when they end with behind. Okay, so we are looking at a two by two by two design where verb, object, and context are manipulated within subject. Um, people read these sentences on the screen, then press a space bar that leads on to a plausibility rating prompt with five points. Um, I'll skip this and comment on the eye tracking finding that examine whether automatic inferences, automatic spatial inferences were made from the, from the verb. If automatic inferences are made, you recall they will show up in increased late reading times for the final context region in inconsistent rather than consistent items. So in items like that lie behind him rather than that lie ahead of him. Totally unsurprisingly, this is what we found in the visual condition, right? So uh, yeah, of course, people take longer to read um, Cheryl saw the picture on the wall behind her than on the wall facing her. Less unsurprisingly, we found the same thing for epistemic 
items like Joe sees the problems that uh, lie behind him. Behind him, longer total reading times than ahead of him. Crucially, now, plausibilities. Again, quite unsurprising, we see that items with visual objects and especially inconsistent ending. Cheryl sees the picture on the wall behind her are deemed way less plausible than um, with consistent endings, right? She sees the problems on the uh, <laughs> picture on the wall facing her. However, crucially, we again find a difference in the epistemic condition where items like Joe sees the problems that lie behind him are deemed less plausible than Joe sees the problems that lie ahead of him. And crucially, this is a categorical difference. So Joe sees the problems that lie ahead of him as being deemed distinctly plausible, means significantly above midpoint free, whereas in the inconsistent condition, uh, it's just deemed neutral. Again, uh, see aware comparisons. You see for both, where meaningful for both, visual items and epistemic items. And again, all differences were categorical. So aware items were plausible, distinctly plausible, um, not so the C items. Okay, so let's sum up the key findings about word processing that I didn't go into and automatic uh, inferences. In this study, fixation times for the object reason provide evidence that subordinate uses of C are processed with the retention suppression strategy. Therefore, the linguistic salience bias hypothesis applies. So is it borne out by findings about automatic inferences? Well, late reading times for the context region provide evidence that spatial inferences are made from purely epistemic uses of C and plausibility ratings reveal that these inappropriate inferences are not just set aside, not completely suppressed, but do go on to influence further cognition. That supports the hypothesis. So let's finally sum up the current state of play. Where are we within the grander scheme of things? Well, in order to support the initial reconstruction of the argument from hallucination, we need to complement the explanation of the fallacy that is being afforded by the linguistic salience hypothesis. We need to complement this explanation with a documentation of the quite specific fallacious inferences that are posited in the argument. You recall these were factive inferences from phenomenal uses of perception verbs. The studies I just mentioned were having a look at spatial inferences from epistemic uses. That's a different thing. Now, we know from corpus studies that phenomenal uses are even less salient than epistemic uses. So the reasoning should carry over. Alas, we don't know anything much about the processing of these uses and therefore the further study is necessary. Uh, it was successfully piloted in uh, February, 2020. And then a thing called COVID happened and well, it has continued to happen. So we only managed to start uh, data gathering before Christmas. So watch this space. Turning to the other of the two arguments that generate jointly the problem of perception, the argument from illusion, we proposed a, in some ways, parallel reconstruction that also invokes contextually inappropriate stereotypical, stereotypical inferences. We propose it relies on contextually canceled inferences from phenomenal uses of appearance verbs to belief attributions. These kinds of um, inferences we have documented in a series of studies with offline measures, with eye tracking, and across linguistic replication. Among other things, we showed that these inferences are not defeated by manner inferences, for example. Okay, so where does this leave us one level higher up yet? Experimental argument analysis exposes and explains fallacies in philosophical arguments. Our findings to date suggest that fallacies of equivocation occur in arguments from illusion and from hallucination that jointly generate the problem of perception. 
This means that characteristically philosophical problems, problems arising from antinomies like the problem of perception, um, may arise only due to verbal fallacies. And if that's the case, then they can be resolved by exposing those fallacies. However, these fallacies can only be exposed experimentally. So the experiments are not some kind of flourish on top of everything else. No, they are an absolutely essential part of the overall argument. This means that experimental argument analysis addresses the Kantian challenge head on. It deploys scientific methods to make an essential contribution to resolving one class of characteristically philosophical problems. It also has further applications in uh, textual hermeneutics and in conceptual engineering. But let me close on a rather grand note. This research program places a small but very interesting and important part of philosophy on the secure path of the science. Thank you. We have a whole lot of time. Um... I found that really fascinating and a wonderful new toolbox that you provided for us. I think it's really important. But the one thing that can be exposed experimentally, well, I mean, you did a wonderful job of exposing the fallacies. So you've exposed the fallacies, and I think, you know, it's very important. So I, I would quibble about that statement in a way. I certainly agree that, that it's important to, to do the experiments to help remediate that these fallacies keep going. That's all I tend to. Um, so people who work in the history of philosophy um, often encounter rather what looks to them like rather odd gaps or indeed mistakes in arguments. And then they spend an incredible amount of time and effort and real ingenuity on trying to show that, no, 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 actually this is not a gap. It can be filled if you take into account various background assumptions which, which we can garner from the rest of the text. And oh no, no, it may look like a mistake, but if you take into account that the author here suggests we interpret this in such and such a way, and that, blah, blah, blah. So the long and the short of it is, in the absence of an empirical explanation, it will always be fair to deny that such a competent thinker made such a crass fallacy and to rather look for alternative interpretations and as, Anybody who's done some, some work on, say, early modern philosophy, which is, employs concepts that are rather alien to us today, uh, or indeed ancient philosophy knows that, God, a lot of scholarly effort is devoted to precisely that task, to explaining away apparent fallacies and gaps. And I absolutely don't mean to make, make any fun of that activity. I, I think that's totally spot on, in particular where texts are framed in a conceptual framework that's alien to us, loads of background assumptions are being made that we're not familiar with, et cetera, et cetera. But the key question, the key task this program is addressing, so how can we make the difference between those cases where this kind of explaining away is totally appropriate and gives us just the right understanding of the text and is exactly what we should do in those cases where no, actually a fallacy is being made and is absolutely essential for the argument. Thank you, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Zach. I found that so fascinating in the final text. Um, so, I mean, when, I wanted to go back to that sentence, um, seize the problems behind a specific problem's head. I wanted to ask, well, you know, we get cost in eye-tracking this kind of question of where that cost is coming from. And I wonder whether this is uh, an alternative explanation for where the cost in sees the problems behind might be coming from. 
I take it that collocations can also affect what inferences are licensed. I take it that problem and behind licenses and the interpretation of resolved and complete, right? Um, so I take it that when that's composed with uh, a static continuous C's verb there, then there could potentially be a higher level clash between the idea that the process is continuing and perhaps there's some kind of transfer to the object should be unresolved or open in some way, but the competing collocation uh, of having a kind of complete event, uh, the problem is resolved. Uh, I wonder whether that's another kind of potential for a confusion that would lead to that constant of test. Well, uh, I mean, standard standard safety measure in these kinds of psycholinguistic experiments is, um, of course, you use several different nouns for the same stimulus class, and you also use different um, cancellation phrases, right? So this wasn't just about problems; it was about risks, opportunities, stuff, um, loads of stuff. Some of it, and indeed, we we did a norming study in which we. Um, asked people to analyze whether things are forward facing or backwards facing as it were, um, balance these things uh, in the materials and uh, then yeah, cancellation phrases. So there was also things like um, overcome, has overcome or has turned from. So while for any individual item, you will probably be able to come up with a, with a compelling alternative story, which, which may even be quite correct. Still, I mean, the way the overall study is designed and the way that the materials are being rotated across lists um, does suggest that that would not be a decisive influence. That's fascinating. I really don't think it's kind of scored out to have compound effects of potentially clashing things going together. So maybe that, um, that I'd be very interested, I'll, I, I won't distract from other questions, but I'd be very interested to see materials to see whether you oh, sure. had uh, cases of bugs that didn't want to align with. Uh, Factor facing indicate completion. Oh, certainly. Sasha, um, give me your email. Good Thank you. Um, and sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Two, uh, hopefully, quick questions. If you don't have time to answer them both, please take the second one. So, the first one is just I wonder to what extent um, verbal processing of arguments might give different saliency effects than visual, because you can't skip and you can't go back. Um, and that not just methodologically, you can't use eye tracking there, but also in the actual susceptibility to particular fallacies might be different. Secondly, um, I'm sort of struck by the fact that what the, the, the account you gave us of this particular perception problem fallacy depends already on having identified prior to an experiment what you think the fallacy is, and then telling us, uh, giving us account of why it's operative perhaps in this case or how it's operative in this case. And I'm wondering if there's a sort of any positive hope of actually being able to identify this kind of fallacious reasoning by the kinds of methods that you're interested in pushing. Uh, sorry, what's the second question then? The second question is if you think that these methods can be used to identify fallacies, not just give us an account of how they arise oh. once they've been identified. Mm -hmm. So um, as to your first question, we can actually study um, auditory processing. And we did that with the pupillometry studies. So in pupillometry studies, people typically hear the stimuli rather than read them. And uh, we measure the pupil dilation. Um, the key measure here would be uh, pupil dilation in the second, also using this cancellation paradigm, would be pupil dilation in the second half of the sentence. And that um, was also then coupled with uh, plausibility ratings. Plausibility ratings totally replicated and pupillometry um, actually completely corresponded to what we then found with the eye tracking. The reason we went on to do the eye tracking is not only that, well, we philosophers do occasionally talk to each other, and in this place actually talk a lot more to each other, which is absolutely great. Um, but still, normally we encounter uh, arguments, of course, in writing, read them, and more importantly, um, eye tracking, as in read tracking reading time measurement, uh, reading times at different stages, also allows you to test processing hypotheses. Now, as to the second question, um, what the methodology does is it allows you to identify a source 
of fallacies and allows you to predict a particular kind of fallacy will happen. Namely, what this hypothesis uh, that I've talked about uh, predicts is that whenever you've got polysemous words used that have a massive salience and balance and um, where the information that's relevant for interpreting a subordinate use is already a subset of the information relevant for interpreting the dominant use, there you will get a fallacy of equivocation. So yes, it is at the same time a tool for prediction. Yeah, no Great, thanks. Um, so I'm really curious about the generality of the result you uh, presented, especially given that you uh, claim to want to use it uh, to investigate possible fallacies in historical philosophy, like early modern and ancient philosophy. Uh, if you do that, uh, in order to do that, I suppose, it's got to be the case that the result sort of generalizes uh, not just uh, to other languages, but to languages uh, that we can't experimentally measure directly, like ancient Greek. Does, do the results uh, support that kind of uh, generality? Um, at this point, I don't think, no. Uh, and indeed, I would I would really hesitate to use these experimental findings to do more than support certain exegetical hypotheses over others, right? Um, because obviously, I mean, we we cannot have any speakers of ancient Greek around, right? <laughs> that would be ridiculous. However. Um, in terms of generalizing, do, do perhaps let me comment on, on one study. Um, Cross-linguistic replication. Now, just looking at one damn language after the other isn't terribly interesting. Rather, what you'd like to look at are languages where you've got some reason to believe that these kinds of fallacies are not going to occur or not from the same words e.g. because of differences in typology, i.e. in standard default word order. So in English, for example, the verb is typically stuck in the middle of the sentence. That gives it a pretty crucial role to play in interpreting the overall sentence in particular because it influences the assignment of thematic roles. So who is doing what to whom, right? That, that's figured out with the, with the verb in English. But that means that inferences from the verb are going to influence overall sentence interpretation rather strongly. By contrast, verb final languages like German or in the extreme Japanese, where the main verb always comes at the absolute end. Right? So da 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 da, red appears. <laughs> okay. um, there, obviously, the verb hasn't got anywhere near as much of a chance of. Uh, shaping uh, sentence comprehension. So it seemed a very fair question to us to ask whether, hang on, these inferences from verbs that we posit are also made in Japanese or not. In fact, to share a secret, we hoped that they would not carry over because in the next step, we then hoped to uh, elicit uh, plausibility ratings for the argument of interest and to show that, oh, Japanese students find them so much worse than English students. Alas, alas, didn't quite pan out that way because um, these inferences just happened to uh, influence uh, judgments also in Japanese. Um, but yes, yeah, so that that is part of the program and we started to address it. All right, we're going to be stopping here at 1.30. From the center. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you very much. For <laughs> One question. If you have more questions, please talk to uh, Joy again or send them an email. And we hope to see you on Friday on John Dalton's talk.